here it is at last, <laughs> my full review of Nikon's Nikkor Z 400mm f4.5 VRS lens. I've had it for about six months now, since the end of last August. So yeah, just over six months. And I guess I felt the need to review it promptly. So I made a sort of preview video four months ago. And as I said at that time, the temptation was to rush a review to completion, if only to take advantage of the buzz surrounding the announcement and release of the lens. But I wanted to show you what this lens is capable of, at least in my hands, shooting a variety of subjects, um, stills and video. I'll say again, as in the last video, that this is not gonna be a technical review. I don't know how optical engineers make all this stuff. They're brilliant, but I'm grateful that we have, first of all, the Z mount itself, that is the foundation of these new designs and all the new glass coatings that minimize flare, chromatic aberration, and protect the open elements. The front element uh, with a non-stick fluorine coat, which repels oil, moisture, and smudges. And for video, reduced focus breathing. Weather sealing is excellent, though I use a, a cover in heavy rain. So let's get the technical specs out of the way and I'll drop them right here. My interest, at least in the new Z-mount telephoto options, began somewhere around the time I ordered the Z9 in late 2021. I'm used in at least one video about the 400 millimeter focal length in particular, since we saw, even in the pre-release teasers for the Z9, a mysterious Z-mount lens, which we soon learned was the variable aperture 100 to 400, 4.5 to 5.6 zoom and I wasn't sure what I wanted. And with the announcement of the 400 millimeter 2.8 TC, <laughs> I announced here that I'd, well, wait and see. Well, it was soon clear that the $18,000 Canadian price tag was a bit rich for me. In the meantime, I'd stayed with what I'd been using for a decade, at least the Z mount equivalent. Since then, I've replaced F mount versions with Z mount 70 to 200 2.8 VRS and two times teleconverter. And that's a nice combo with the new Z mount TC, a noticeable improvement over the old TC 20 E3. And I still own the old version, just in case I should buy another compatible F mount lens. But when the 400 F 4.5 was announced, I was all ears and I guess eyes too. <laughs> and I said in that previous video, my quandary with the 100 to 400 anyway, uh, was the fact that with the addition of the two times TC, it becomes an F11 lens. Obviously, with the fixed 400 prime, we lose the variability of a zoom, but we do get the extra light gathering ability. The two times TC turns the 400 4.5 into a minimum F9 lens. And that can mean a lot when you're, say, shooting sport or wildlife in challenging light conditions. Oh, and price. The 4.5 lens comes in at $4,100 Canadian. So that's not chump change, but when I walked into my local camera store and saw a copy sitting on the shelf, well, I was actually quite surprised to see it there, uh, going on the difficulty of getting some of the lenses, but I wasn't gonna let it out of my sight until it was tucked into the back of the car. As for the 1.4 TC, which turns this into a 560 millimeter 6.3 lens, it's been really hard to get the whole time I've had this lens until a couple of weeks ago when I snagged one from Vistec here in Canada. So how is this lens with the two times TC? Well, I admit, looking at my first tests, I wasn't that impressed. And I said so on social media, but then I just started shooting and enjoying the reach. And I'm not gonna do the pixel peeping here because really I'd rather you just judge things as they appear, reproduced here. That's not the best way to judge things perhaps, who knows how many different kinds of screens. The majority I know from analytics and a recent poll viewed on phones. I can tell you, and I've printed images to 13 by 19 from files made with the 400 and the two times TC. And to my eye, they're beautiful. When it comes to video, it's just as nice. I began my test within a day or two of bringing it home. I'd be making some test shots from our deck and a few days before I'd noticed that after six months, the Z9 sensor had started to accumulate some 
intractable spots, despite the leaf shutter on the Z9 that comes down during lens changes and what I consider best practices during changes. But I was absolutely gobsmacked to notice an insane amount of debris on some of the shots of the starlings. Incidentally, starlings are not endemic to this part of the world and they're rightfully considered a pest. But I've got to admit they're, they're a handsome, if not songful bird. <laughs> now, the recently implanted intraocular lens was still settling into my left focusing eye. So I magnified the image on the LCD, then took another look through the viewfinder. Just a minute, <laughs> the dust is in motion. Holy sh This was one of those times when Nikon's quick switch to video, now that's almost universally adopted by other manufacturers, it came in real handy. When I first flipped the movie switch, to record this natural wonder, the camera was set at 4K. After getting an initial clip, lest this scene disappear into the sunset, I hurriedly changed to 8K, knowing that I could then zoom or punch in on the scene. This was before firmware 3.0, which now allows us to zoom digitally in 4K. This then is with the two times teleconverter for, of course, a total of 800 millimeters. A couple of hours before sunset and these birds and the whole scene is facing west into the sun. Couldn't have been better lighting. This is certainly the first time that I've seen a spectacle like this. Now I've since learned that starlings are one of the species that feed on wasps. And I presume what they're doing is uh, they're making a meal of these wasps. I'm guessing they've opened up the nest nearby. Whatever, they seem relatively unruffled, <laughs> so to speak, by, um, well, you can see the insects attacking them and they appear to occasionally dislodge one from under a wing or wherever. Crazy. Just days before I made these clips, we got run out of a restaurant by an overabundance of aggressive wasps. So I've learned to appreciate even this invasive bird species has its virtues. At this point, I'll talk a little bit about some accessories I needed for my use case. You may or may not need to add these to your kit, but I'll mention these just in case. When it comes to video recording, this lens presented a problem in terms of its large 85 millimeter filter thread. First, a protective filter doesn't come cheap. Not that I put cheap glass in front of my expensive lenses, so <laughs> people who worry about such things can uh, relax. At my local shop, I had a choice between a $350 filter, I can't remember, the brand, and Nikon's own NC neutral color filter for $190. I figured, <laughs> why not take a chance on Nikon? You can judge the results here, with the filter and without. When it comes to video recording specifically, but not exclusively, what if you need to control light because 180 degree rule or subject isolation? You want to maintain that f4.5 aperture. I mostly shoot at 24 frames a second, ergo 1 50th of a second shutter speed. The Z9, base ISO of 64 on the Z9, helps here. But if I want to maintain a wider aperture in bright conditions, then I need an ND filter. So a step down ring is needed if I'm going to use my existing ND filters that I've standardized to 80 two millimeters. Strangely, it's nearly impossible to find one of these things locally. At least this configuration, 95 to 82. Nothing from the usual brands, Nisi Koken et al, that I could find. I had to order this rare bird from China. As I've noted before, I like these stepping rings from Ampofo, uh, even if it's hard to pronounce. They're machined to tight tolerances and they're a bargain compared to brass rings, if you can find those. But the problem, when it comes to step down rings, there's always the danger of vignetting, especially with wide lenses, it's almost a given. So how about with telephoto lenses? I had to wait and see. So we add the step down ring, I've removed my protective filter, which I do when using NDs, and then screw in the variable ND, this one from Nisi. The adapter for my usual matte box I'm afraid it's not going to work with this, but who needs it when you have this big shade that comes with the lens? There's no problem fitting it over this combo. And here's the moment of truth. If there's any vignetting here, I can't see it. 
So it looks like we're ready for any occasion. That's great to know. We can step this down at least to 82 millimeters, and that saved me a lot of bucks. Just a note on adaptation for Arca Swiss. I have never bought a replacement foot for any of my telephoto lenses. And I don't criticize Nikon for not building the dovetail into the lens foot. Not everyone uses Arca Swiss. Personally, I have no problem adding my plate of choice to this lens foot that comes with the, with the lens. The only problem with plates these days, like step-down rings, is finding one. A well-made, reasonably priced one. First off, I want one that's reasonably long. Long enough to balance my camera and lens on the gimbal. And I often hold the lens by the foot and plate, which kind of spreads out the weight. I've had a 115 millimeter, a four and a half inch surefoot unit from Jobu, same Canadian company as my gimbal, for over a decade, and it stays on my 70 to 200. It's totally bomb proof. But these days it costs around $70 Canadian. And after spending five grand on the lens, <laughs> I was looking to penny pinch. Enter this 120 millimeter plate from, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it properly, Hoag, Hoagie, <laughs> but I don't think they make sandwiches in Philadelphia. While it's not quite as beefy <laughs> as the Jobu, it certainly appears to be up for the job. I like that it has laser engraved reference scales so you can make a note of the balance position. It has uh, safety stop screws, same as the Jobu, and I've seen no sign of flexing with this. And it costs just $27.99 after a 33% discount via Amazon. I'm not buying the argument that using a plate adds too much weight. The plate weighs less than 55 grams, total with the existing foot, a smidgen, and that's not a bird, <laughs> over 150 grams. Compared to replacement foots from, say, Really White Stuff or Kirk, they weigh in at around 90 grams. So yes, you will save 50 to 60 grams around the weight of this plate, if that's worth 100 to $140 for you. In anemic Canadian dollars, that runs closer to $200. So from my point of view, an expensive replacement foot is not the best use of my budget. And I'm quite happy to add a plate like this. I've tried, since I took possession of the lens at the very end of August, to use it in as many different ways as possible. Though telephotos shouldn't be seen as just sport and wildlife lenses, I guess we often consider them that. But I think they work really well for landscape. I love the kind of compression that's possible with longer lenses, and I never grow tired of shooting over the treed ridge lines, especially when there's some atmospheric conditions. And now, <laughs> a word from our sponsor, me. Because apart from the odd product provided by companies for review, with no other payment involved, this channel is completely funded by yours truly. Before you click away, can I ask you one favor? If you're enjoying or learning anything valuable from this video, please do give it a like. And Subscribe to the channel if this is your first time here because we'd love to see you again. Hit that notification bell while you're at it. It takes a lot of labor, not to mention financial resources, to keep this channel going. So, if you'd really like to contribute, there's a couple of ways you can support it. There's the super thanks button below every video, and there's my PayPal link in the description. Every dollar counts. Even enough for a coffee at the end of uh, one of these chilly shoots is much appreciated. Cheers. Now, back to the show. The amazing lightness of this lens being, as it is, just 1160 grams for me was one of the main attractions. I can actually handhold this lens for long periods, which was something I just couldn't do with other telephoto lenses. I've mentioned in other videos that my wrists are 
pretty shot arthritis and chronic carpal tunnel syndrome. And I haven't suffered the usual resulting pain with this setup. I can even hold a cup of coffee afterwards without worrying that I'll drop it. And I must stress how well balanced this lens is. It's really a pleasure to use because the, the big elements are concentrated toward the rear of the lens. There's yet one more option with this combo, DX mode. So whether we turn the 400 into a 600 for going the 2 times TC or adding the 2 times TC for a total of 1200 millimeters, this is a really adaptable system. More often than not, what separates a good photo from a great photo, especially when it comes to the long shot, is the background or bokeh. And with this lens, while it's not spectacular in that regard, it's very, very good. And I'm happy with the results I'm getting. No, it's definitely not the 2.8, but again, at this price, I think it holds up its bokeh end very well. As far as the focusing experience, well, combined with the Z9, which continues to receive firmware tweaks that have improved acquisition, tracking, and stickiness, uh, 3.0 that I mentioned in my original preview to the latest 3.10. This lens just got an update itself in January. That was uh, 1.10. Whatever they're doing with these stepping motors, they're awesome and near silent. Great for video. The focus recall button lets me return to a saved uh, distance with a function button. There's up to six stops of VR, which really helps. Here I am uh, covering a demonstration and we've got the 400 4.5. And so I already know that this will be eminently usable for photojournalism. Uh, particularly for covering uh, headshots, getting headshots and close in video, so particularly on the stage. I do have in my bag also the 70 to 200. That's good for most of the rest of the use case here. Basically, this is the first time that I'm going to be using the Z400 4.5 to cover something like this, and I'm confident that it's going to be great. Some of my photos showcase just how sharp, brilliant, and saturated this lens can be. And as I said last October, this lens inspires me to get out and just shoot, even when it's uh, just a plate.
So there's six months with the Z400 f4.5 VRS. It is without a doubt one of the very best lenses of any length that I've ever owned. No doubt I'll be including more photos and videos made with it in future posts. So be sure to check back uh, also in the Nikon gear playlist. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, again, please do give it the old thumbs up. In the meantime, take care of yourself. Cheers, and we'll see you later.